know a lot of you are aware, but Illinois is not the only state that has gun control measures in place that people say violate their Second Amendment rights. You've got the litigation in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals challenging the state's gun and magazine ban. You've also got the Void card being challenged in Sangamon County Court. We talked about those earlier this week and even earlier today, reviewing the latest filing in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals challenging the gun and magazine ban filed by Thomas Mag on behalf of the Langley plaintiffs. But where are we at with that case and also where are we at with other cases across the country uh, dealing with uh, Second Amendment challenges? Uh, to talk further about this here with me, Greg Bishop, it is Springfield's Morning News, joined by Freedoms Steel from YouTube and also uh, a gun rights guru uh, in the state of Illinois, Todd Vandermeid. You don't really need too much of an introduction, Todd. People know who you are, uh, but let's get into it. Where are we at with the well, Illinois evidently case? Evidently, media matters. Evidently, media matters doesn't know who I am because they chastised you for not listing me as an NRA lobbyist, even though I haven't worked for the NRA for over five years. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty remarkable. And you even publicly, regularly on your YouTube channel say you're a former NRA lobbyist. But yeah, media matters aside, uh, the, the issue of uh, gun legislation here in Illinois, very contentious. Uh, where are we at with the, the federal case in the Seventh Circuit? Uh, and is there going to be any re resolve before January 1st? Well, that depends. So first off, uh, we are we filed our briefs on Monday uh, with Barnett taking the lead on that. We now there is a, uh, a hope for an Amici campaign to come in. Their briefs are due Monday. Uh, we have received word that it sounds like the state is going to oppose any Amici briefs that come in because of the short time time period for filing and. Somehow it sounds like they couldn't get their side ramped up. So we'll see what that looks like. We have oral arguments next Thursday morning at 9 o'clock in downtown Chicago, waiting to see what three-judge panel we get. So we will see what that panel looks like. And based on that panel, we can kind of toss a coin as to what outcome we may or may not see. Um, and then from there, it depends. I mean, um, last time Judge Easterbrook sat on a panel was the McDonald panel of record. Um, he did a, another decision earlier, late last week, but um, and he issued the opinion against the gun owners for the city of Chicago in two weeks. Now, I doubt that he's going to do anything like that. Uh, I, it would be nice that if we were to lose at the appellate panel, to lose quickly so we can have a writ of cert up in front of the Supreme Court uh, and plenty of time for them to take it up in the fall conference. Um, that's the big thing. If we get any decision between now and, uh, you know, before the court goes back, uh, we can make a petition for cert to have them uh, take the case up. Uh, and that would mean that if they take the case up 12 months from now, we will be staring down a decision from the Supreme Court on this issue. You have uh, Judge Easterbrook issued a, a decision uh, from a three-judge panel in the Court of Appeals on a case called Holden, which is about somebody lying to a gun dealer. The district court tossed out the 922G1 as being unconstitutional. The panel turned around and then said that, wait a minute, he wasn't, or 922 uh, and he wasn't charged under that. He was charged with making false statements, a different part of the statute, and therefore it doesn't fall under the Second Amendment. And so he kind of completely flipped the uh, argument there. Uh, then you had on Tuesday the Atkinson case come out. This was about a challenge to 922G1, uh, about whether or not categorical bans on nonviolent felons is constitutional. And with Judge Sykes, the chief judge, and Judge Scudder, uh, Scudder writing the opinion, they remanded it uh, back to the lower court for the historical review that the New York case now requires. But they threw some good nuggets in there for our side. Uh, they flatly admit that interest balancing is now out the window. Um, it's a 12-page decision. I think the thing that's more uh, interesting in that is the dissent by Judge Wood, one of the judges on the motions panel that gave a stay to our case, 
Uh, and I think Judge Wood is very much on the other side, and she is finding ways through her legal rationale to point out that if you do this, if you do that, she sees workarounds through both Heller and New York. Well, and I want to focus on that that. just a moment here, Todd, but uh, just to go back to the interest balancing issue here, seems that the state, at least in the uh, Barnett at all case in the Seventh Circuit, uh, they're they're saying, hey, uh, these uh, these weapons, these firearms are uh, technically advanced, uh, they're more dangerous, they're unusual, they're more lethal, Uh, we've got, uh, you know, uh, mass shootings that are happening, uh, so, so are you saying that those are 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 no longer valid arguments to to justify uh, laws that uh, some say curbs Second Amendment rights? Well, what the state is trying to do is they are um, cutely trying to wiggle interest balancing back in via the other portions that were left open under Heller, dangerous and unusual, uh, the in common use stuff. I mean, they, they they clearly sat there and shoved a whole bunch of interest balancing into their briefs by the mass shootings. They are tragic, but they bear no they they have no bearing on the the law at hand in terms of that you know the the that's the interest balancing that they want to bring back in. The issue in front of us is whether or not are they, you know you, you go, does the text of the Second Amendment cover this? Yes, it covers it. Uh, because it is the ownership and possession and carrying of certain types of arms. And then from there we go to, are they in common use? I think by uh, by the broad definitions used under the law, they most clearly are in common use, even if you just talk about AR or AK platform guns. Uh, but then they try to get to the dangerous and unusual. And this is where, obviously, nobody in the AG's office knows anything about firearms because they say, oh, the AR-15 and the 223 or 556 is, oh, this much more dangerous and lethal, and they're using all kinds of terms. They completely neglect that a bunch of the guns banned under this are 22s, and that they also, the AR platform nowadays not only comes in uh, two, two, three, or five, five, six, but it also comes in things like nine millimeter, which is a standard handgun round, uh, and yet it's one of the rounds they compare to two, two, three against. So they make no. Uh, I mean, they're either wholly stupid or completely disingenuous in the arguments they make about what they're trying to ban. Let's get it straight. They don't like guns. They don't like you exercising your right to have guns. They want to be the state's monopoly on the use of force for whatever they want. Todd, just briefly touch on uh, the the arguments, the dissent in the Atkinson case made uh, that you say uh, uh, seems to kind of uh, find workarounds for for judges who may want to try to, uh, you know, uphold gun control measures. Yeah, uh, Justice Wood sat there and did a uh, dissent, and in this dissent, she goes on to talk about how ubiquitous that regulation on firearms were in 1791. She does a very good job of saying, hey, the time period is here, 1791, and she breaks down how um, all these regulations existed. And if all these regulations existed, and she breaks them down into categories, and the way she writes this, in her mind, she could shoehorn in virtually any gun regulation. And if you read how she phrases these things, and, th- and how she says things about this, she clearly is giving them, you know, I don't think there's a gun control regulation uh, short of a flat-out ban on every, every you know, handgun, rifle, shotgun that, the, uh, that she wouldn't uphold. And I think she has laid out a framework and an argument to be made as to how. Now, she criticizes the Supreme Court that they discounted uh, three founding era laws about the storage of gunpowder, and she tried to equate the amount of population in those three colonies that then turned into states with the total population of the 13 colonies. And her argument is akin to saying that Chicago, New York, and L.A. should set the policy for the nation. And she goes on a, uh, uh, a whole thing, well, if three aren't enough, are four enough, and she lambastes the 
uh, the court not accepting territorial laws back in the day and the like. Um, it's a 29-page dissent. I count 42 passages of that that are of interest to me. Uh, I'll be releasing some videos in that we can get into a lot more deeper than what we can do here. But I think that sometimes you learn more by reading what your opponents write than talking to your own. Todd Vandermeide, Freedoms Steal on YouTube. Uh, surely a lot of people tuned in now are very familiar with you, uh, so be sure to check that out. I want to lastly get your reaction to President Joe Biden, who earlier this week during a campaign event in California, uh, a transcript that the White House provided, uh, the president talked about the Second Amendment, said that he's a Second Amendment guy, quote, uh, and that he taught it in college, quote. Uh, but he also uh, said he, 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 he likes the guys who say, you know, the, the tree of liberty is uh, watered uh, by generational uh, blood of uh, patriots. He fudged that quote entirely. But and then he went on to say, uh, if you want to defend against the government, you're going to have to have F-16s. And during the founding of the country, people couldn't own cannons. Is the is the president just you know making you know political statements to to raise funds, or what? what is it just a total misunderstanding of uh, of our text in history? I think his Alzheimer's is showing. Uh, but first off, so take the original armory, Springfield Armory. They didn't start making muskets till around 1790, 1791 at the time of the ratification of the Bill of Rights. They were actually making cannons. And yes, under our text and history, the history is that we had privateers, even in naval stuff and uh, local armories and individuals were allowed to own uh, cannons. Matter of fact, a friend of mine has the largest mortar collection in the United States, including a 13,000 pound shore mortar. I'll have to send you a picture of it. Uh, he uses that as a yard, uh, yard ornament. Um, but F-16s and the like, uh, let me see, Viet Cong, Mujahideen, and Taliban. Do those things uh, kind of connect with anything? I don't know. How long were we in Afghanistan and Iraq? 20-plus years. Uh, we had the most sophisticated equipment, but uh, you know, we essentially uh, right. left as a draw of sorts. How many MiGs did the Viet Cong have? None. Uh, how, you know, how, how many uh, Mirages, MiGs, or otherwise did the uh, Afghanis have when they went up against the Russians as the Mujahideen? None. How many did the Taliban have uh, after, you know, we pummeled them for 20 years? None. So they do have a bunch of helicopters and stuff now. Whether or not they can keep them flying is a different thing. But, no, I, I think Joe Biden, they like to jump the shark saying, well, that, that you, you, you want to have hand grenades and, and nuclear weapons, and where does it stop? And this is where, you know, they just jumped the shark worse than Fonzie ever did. Todd Vandermeid, greatly appreciate your time this morning. We'll definitely connect again soon. All right, be safe out there. Hey, dude, take care. It is Springfield's Morning News, now 654 from Culver's West on Wabash. Work with a team that cares about being the best.